Hi, my name is Bhaskar Sharkar. Uh, I am I teach in the Film and Media Studies Department here at UCSB, of which currently I'm also the chair. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Rohan Shiv Kumar and Abhijit Mukul Kishore, dear friends from Bombay. We just finished watching uh, their film Nostalgia for the Future from this year, right? It was released yeah. this year, yeah. And it was produced by the Films Division of India, and we have a lot to talk about that aspect. Uh, very briefly, Obhijit Mukul Kishore is a filmmaker and cinematographer based in Mumbai, working in documentary and interdisciplinary moving image practices. He's involved in cinema pedagogy as a lecturer and curates film programs for prominent national cultural institutions. His films as director include Snapshots from a Family Album, which I believe we have in our collection, Vertical City, To Let the World In, Electric Shadows, and Nostalgia for the Future. And as cinematographer, some of the most intriguing documentaries to come out of India in recent years, Kumar Talkies, Kali Salwar, John and Jane, Bidesia in Bombay, I am a micro, and an old dog's diary, and seven islands and a metro, which many of you will remember we screened exactly a year ago in Pollock Theatre. And Rohan Shivkumar is an architect and an urban designer practicing in Mumbai. He is the Dean of Research and Academic Development at Kamala Raheja Vidya Nidhi Institute for Architecture and Environmental Studies. His work spans architectural and interior design to urban research and consultancy on issues concerning housing, public space, and sanitation. He's interested in exploring the many ways of reading and representing the city, and is co-editor of a magisterial publication on the research and art collaboration Project Cinema City, which really explores the intersection between Bombay the cinema and Bombay the city. He also curates film programs and writes for Anarchitect, which is a blog on cinema and urban issues. He's now working on a book discussing approaches to the design of homes among Indian architectural practices. So first question, why nostalgia for the future? And of course by that I'm not asking you why not nostalgia for the past. But I also noticed that the Hindi title uh, translates directly as waiting for the future. So if you could speak a bit about that. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot, Bhaskar, uh, Emily, Matt, everyone here for you know inviting us and uh, uh, screening our film here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, about the title, Nostalgia for the Future, and you know it is an oxymoron, you know, Nostalgia for the Future. Likewise, in Hindi, Kal Ka Intazar, which I'll get into uh, you know in a moment. Um, we are talking about the construction of a future, you know, uh, looked at from the moment of let's say independence of, of nation building in the late 1940s, early 1950s. You are imagining a future, you know, uh, that you're working towards. And we now in retrospect are belong to that future which was then imagined. You know, so we looking at everything that moment stood for in terms of how our future or, you know, or our present, how, how that future and our present was getting imagined. And um, what that meant, how much of that actually came through and uh, what the failures were along the way, what the slippages and failures were along the way. Um, so yeah, it is, I mean, in effect, looking at that entire moment of Nehruvian modernity. And, uh, you know, for uh, Rohan, you know, his practice of architecture carries within it this note of, um, is, is burdened with, let's say, let's say um, uh, uh, um, an agenda of hope you know, because you're building a future, you're building residences, nations, and so on. In my case, as a documentary filmmaker and cinematographer, you are burdened with the entire uh, notion of truth, you know, of recording truth, of representing truth, and so on. And I have therefore been very, very interested in this entire process of films division, and later independent documentary, not just recording, but informing this idea of citizenship, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the film deals with that moment, the anxieties of that moment, the hopes and aspirations of that moment. Um, and our producers, you know, being, you know, it being a government organization, we were required to have two titles, English and Hindi. And nostalgia, the term was impossible to translate. 
you know, because etymolo uh, etymologically it, 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 it means uh, a longing for home, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the word nostalgia. And uh, we did not have any such, you know, a, a suitable word for that in Hindi. So we decided to have this rhetorical, very propagandist films division kind of title you know, saying, waiting for a tomorrow, waiting for a better tomorrow, waiting for a golden future. And there are films like this that exist, you know, in that archive, which are periodically made, you know. And uh, the kind of, the kind of uh, um, oxymoron that, you know, the kind of contradiction that happens between nostalgia and future in the English title, likewise, when you look at the Hindi title, Kal Ka Intazar, it means um, literally waiting for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But then the word Kal, tomorrow, also means yesterday. Yeah. You know, so therefore the entire querying of those temporalities, yesterday and tomorrow, you know, happening in both the titles, English and Hindi. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've seen this now the sixth time. Wow. And uh, <laughs> the more I watch this film, the more I think you want us to speculate along with you people. Like, you're not giving us a, this is the meaning of the film, right? That not that, it's not that kind of a film. And in that uh, spirit, I was thinking, you know, waiting for tomorrow, but that tomorrow, it's a tomorrow that will never arrive. Yeah. Because the, the developmentalist paradigm promises a tomorrow that is always, yeah. you know, in the future. In the future. It always yeah. remains virtual, Absolutely. right? So it's an aspirational horizon more than yeah. anything else. Yeah. But I was also thinking maybe another way to think of this would be uh, all the futures that were perhaps possible once but that were never materialized, mm. you know? So the, all the lost possibilities. Mm. And here, you know, in a, a minute ago, you mentioned the term Nehruvian modernity. Now that makes a lot of sense for us, but if you could unpack that for the audience a bit. Yeah. And, and you know, to think about like, what are the possibilities that may not have transpired? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, this is a kind of the film actually emerged out of a, like a serious anxiety uh, concerning uh, the professions, at least for me as an architect, mm -hmm. uh, as well as you know being a middle class male within within kind of an urban India, right? And there was a certain way in which we seem to have benefited from the project of modernity, uh, you know, uh, education, freedom, whatever. You know, there's a certain kind of benefit that we as a class or we as a profession seem to have reaped the benefits of a certain imagined future. Uh, from you know when when we had independence, there was this idea of constructing a democratic nation uh, where we would, we would all be free and you know and the works. Uh, it seemed as if today within the uh, within the architecture profession, that very idea of hope that is so deeply embedded within the profession seemed to have seems to have been relinquished. That it doesn't seem like we want to build for hope anymore. Mm -hmm. It seems as if we built perpetually, kind of catering to you know the latest style or fashion or the you know economic sort of stuff that's mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that there was a certain kind of um, there was a certain kind of hope that or a, or a, that was lost at that point and all those like you said all those possible futures that we could have been that there was a sort of dotted line of a possible uh, citizen that we were supposed to inhabit uh, and there was a kind of let's say utopianism uh, to that it seemed as if uh, with the failure of ne of that big modernist project in the way that these large dams were made or large ecological systems were completely destroyed, it seemed as if we gave up the project of modernity in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, the the the, the anxiety was that a certain kind of lo longing for that modern moment and the value systems that it represented for, because we all in many ways inhabited that uh, and actually products of that, um, and also the the let's say the Acknowledgement of the fact that so much of that was so incredibly violent in nature. So mm -hmm. you're right when you say that the, pr the the film that has no answers. The film is actually a kind of is about the confusion of mm -hmm. the current, let's say, uh, profession. In my case, and in his case, filmmaker. Uh, we'll come back to this a little later again, probably. But uh, I wanted to start by asking about you know. When the title of the film comes on, we are on blueprints and then architectural models, right? So it seems to me that one of the ways in which the film slowly, I will use the word devolves, but in a particular way, right? Uh, into more and more, you know, digressions. And when you start with the palace section and then even the Le Corbusier, things are much more, the narration is still more integrated or coherent. 
and then slowly you go into other things, right? There's a dispersal that happens. Yeah. So you are in a way mimicking the process of dispersion that you see in the very project of nation building and modernity, right? Mm -hmm. But also I thought, you know, the blueprint uh, always brings up the ways in which planning and that kind of technocratic rationality can never quite organize everyday life into its imagined compartments, yeah. right? So that there's always spillage and excess that happens. Yeah. Uh, that was very conscious, and, and, and you're right, actually, the film was structured like that, is that we had this, it was an unraveling, uh, a certain kind of, let's say, silence and quietness in the beginning, or, uh, uh, and, and you know, the male kind of uh, voice of God, voiceover, uh, speaking in Hindi, uh, that starts off saying things like, okay, we know everything and we shall tell you, you know, uh, you know what, what, what the truth is. And slowly towards the end, at the end of the film, of course, saying, Ki, wow, voice is the home. So there's a complete dismantling mm -hmm. of any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, certainties. Um, and yeah, the film really wanted to look at this very, the dotted line that I mentioned earlier of that perfect citizen. Yeah. And the fact that none of us can actually fit in there. Either we are incomplete or we overspill it. So if you look at you know many of the sections, one of the important thing for us to look at were these uh, kinds of people who were the project of modernity, but always were a little kind of puzzled by that project, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily the subjects of that project that we were trying to, as a middle class kind of modernists, trying to say, okay, this is for you, whether that's as an architect or as a filmmaker, and those guys looking up at you and thinking, you know, they're not certain what you're looking at us for. Yeah. How do you incorporate us into your narratives? Yeah, and what is your narrative? And are we supposed to perform that narrative for you? Yeah. Or, you know, and so you have that stare at the camera, yeah. right? From the beginning of the film, and of course, right towards the end, uh, you have that stare to the camera of what can be called the subaltern subject uh, of the project of modernity, who we claimed was the subject that we wanted to, in that sense, mm. uplift, whether that's as, whether that's the state, or whether that's the, you know, in Mughal's case, the documentary filmmaker. <laughs> Uh, but never really kind of being able to kind of really trans transcend that boundary, um, that lens uh, or that gaze boundary. So that's very much what was. I mean, there's so many places that if you see in the film, you watch that overspilling happen. You, I don't know whether you remember that scene where you had in Delhi, uh, you had this man sitting on a bench, park bench, with his leg folded, and he's talking to somebody. Uh, but that person he's talking to cannot meet his eyes at the same level because he obviously belongs to a lower caste. So he's sitting on the ground, hunched over, and he's having a conversation, although there's an empty bench right behind him. You see? Uh, so it seems as if, all, so we tried to kind of in many ways look at these sorts of things as uh, that begin and of course towards the end overspill the film itself. Mm -hmm. uh, some basic, I, you know, questions. Yeah. Choice of the buildings, why these buildings? Okay, that's again my... Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, uh, so the buildings, we started off with three um, in the beginning. Uh, the first one was very certain that we wanted to place the project of modernity not at the moment of independence. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really wanted to look at the idea of the performed modernity. The idea of the costume uh, was an important part of the mm -hmm. conception of the film. That to become something, you wear something to become it. Mm -hmm. um, that was one sort of moment. And we really felt that the sort of Maharajas uh, were an important sort of moment in that because they performed the modernity for their colonial masters very often mm -hmm. by the homes that they got designed uh, for themselves and, um, and to entertain their British masters in. So we had this idea of using a palace in Gwalior called the Jai Vilas Palace, which is this neoclassical huge thing has a train that carries cigars and wine on the dining table. Mm -hmm. It has the works. It was kind of amusing. Uh, but, uh, well, it was too expensive for us to shoot there. That is one. And secondly, <laughs> we found this other palace, which is Lakshmi Vilas Palace, which is actually far more interesting for us because it has two other stories or three other mm -hmm. stories that are related to it. Yeah. Uh, one, of course, being the story of Raja Ravi Verma, one of the first modern painters of India. Uh, and we kind of digress into that very quickly. And more importantly, uh, the Maharaja sponsored the education of uh, Dr. Ambedkar. And for those who do, you don't know, uh, Dr. Ambedkar was a Dalit or a uh, lower caste, or outside, actually outside caste. Uh, untouchable. Untouchable. Uh, 
who was educated uh, by this Maharaja in Columbia University in the US. And then when he came back to India, he then became the, he wrote the, he was the architect of the Indian constitution. So it was a really important story. And like you have, might have seen within the film, he uh, always wore blue suits. I mean, he wore suits actually in public because he wanted to, through his body, uh, distance himself from his, from the past, from, from the caste that he was assigned. Uh, he, he built his house also very similarly, actually. He built his house uh, like this Western style house. So that was, which is why we chose Lakshmi Vilas. I won't digress too much into it. The second home had to be a Corbusier home because he was such so important for Nehru mm -hmm. uh, in the way that uh, uh, that particular sort of brutal uh, yeah. modern, uh, kind of nat nat natural man was imagined as the future man of the, uh, who was going to be the Indian citizen. And he did build the Shodhan Villa and one more home in uh, Ahmedabad. So that was the second home. Uh, Gandhi actually arrived much later into the film. While we were in Ahmedabad, he said that this Gandhi ashram seemed like a great example as a transition between Ahmedabad and of course the DDA housing projects, which had to be uh, a certain kind. I mean, because in many ways, the choices were based on the different bodies that were imagined by the four homes. The first home was the costumed body, which is the Maharaja's palace. The second was the naked body, which is the, which is the naked body in nature rather, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Nehruvian Chodhan house. The third is where the body is also seen as something that can be unpredictable because it's pleasurable perhaps. So you have the Gandhian body, the ascetics body. Yeah. Um, and the fourth home is where the spirit is also completely uh, kind of given up, relinquished in place of pure flesh, uh, where the flesh is then shaped to build this city, build the nation. So that was a fundamental sort of narrative. Did you find them to be cinematic, these spaces? Or was that a challenge mm. anywhere? Uh, we pretty much knew why we were shooting these spaces. And, um, you know, so how one would uh, approach these. I mean, people ask us how much time it, you know, it took to research and formulate, uh, you know, the concept of the film and so on. And it's something that uh, is pretty much spanning our own respective, the length of our respective um, practices, you know. Mine is a documentary filmmaker, Rohan's as an architect and an academic. And uh, yeah, I mean, so, you know, um, so the spaces, of course, pretty much dictated how we'd shoot and uh, what everything else that happened around them, you know. Uh, what I found extremely challenging, challenging to shoot was the Capitol Complex at Chandigarh. You know, because uh, it, this is iconic architecture, it's been photographed a million times. How do you uh, sh shoot it now, you know, for this particular film? And uh, so it took us a while to, you know, work out a style for that, which is fast moving, handheld, jittery, and uh, not jittery, but yeah, a little edgy, you know. Uh, likewise, through the film, and as you said, you know, the film starts devolving halfway through and goes into various other layers. The other thing that um, the film very consciously uh, attempts is to work with these various different uh, visual registers. There's the here and now, which is shot on digital video, but also color and black and white. And those decisions were made while filming. You know, it, what is black and white is shot black and white. It's not made black and white later. Uh, and we decided to shoot on 16 millimeter film. Again, both color and black and white. Um, not because, you know, filmmakers think that celluloid film is superior to video, but uh, because it, it, it carries this register of memory. You know, it carries this register of remembering how, you know, these images might have been made if these films were made at the time of those buildings being made, uh, lived in, and, and, and so on. Um, so, let's say uh, our brief to me, the cinematographer, was while shooting 16 millimeter was to uh, maybe shoot these as home movies that were never made, mm -hmm. you know. So the look is very different, you know, the, the video footage is formal, planted, descriptive, which becomes, you know, the other things later. But the 16 millimeter is very handheld and very free and jerky and, and so on. Whether you're looking at the tourist spaces, like later in Delhi or the lake in Chandigarh, which is very much a part of Corbusier's plan of the space of recreation for the public, um, the citizen, which is, who is the citizen who's inhabiting this space? It is a middle class to upper middle class kind of citizen, or let's say people who aspire to be that, you know? So we shot there on a winter evening, 
uh, color and then you know that entire the the what's called the sector sector 17 market in Chandigarh again designed by Corbusier where that boy is you know blowing bubbles so somebody else remarked once that you know oh you first see him blowing these bubbles and you think oh it's cute nostalgia little boy blowing bubbles but later you realize he's selling those bubbles he's not you know merely there for that particular purpose so um, yeah what was to be shot on video what was to be shot on film is something uh, that we decided pretty much on the spot responding to it and uh, I must say that we were pretty 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 precise while shooting this film you know in terms of how much we shot and how much made its way into the film and how. There's some great lyrical moments of camera movement and you know the way you take us into those interiors but my favorite was probably when you're talking about the erotics of the interface between nature and sure. the buildings mm. and the way things dissolve, right? And mm. yeah. That building itself is, I mean, if you're talking about the erotic, that building is yeah. sexy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, beautiful, I mean, beautiful architecture to shoot. It's also a challenge, you know, how do you shoot architecture? Yeah. And how do you shoot it differently for each of those uh, sites? Uh, where some of it is meant to be formal, some of it is meant to be this free-flowing home movie. So, um, yeah, it was... Nice. So, you know, you kind of have addressed the answer the question that I had next about the range of material. So archival footage, yeah. uh, including uh, films division documentaries, but also Bombay films from the 60s and 50s, um, Ravi Varma art, uh, digital video, sometimes in color, sometimes in black and white. Um, so this is the thing that I still would like to know is at the level of editing, what, can you think of any challenges that you faced where you know you were like, okay, what do I do with this now? Maybe some anecdote. So the anecdote I have is this: is that I panicked. Uh, we had uh, uh, we had this film, the footage we, we shot in the winter in Delhi, and we shot in summer in Ahmedabad and Baroda, and the footage sat for a long time. Uh, and then we got a letter from a producer saying, "In two weeks, we want your film," and there was no film. Uh, and uh, I was I started. I mean, obviously, I started palpitating. And so then I sat and I wrote the script in English, entirely, um, completely in English, uh, over two days, literally. Like hammered it out with like some general images on the right side, Excel sheet, of course. Architect mm. needs a plan, right? And then uh, that plan was then given to Mukul, mm. uh, who had already cut the opening sequence, that opening sequence of the stairs and that piece of music. And then we decided to uh, convert the film away from this English language uh, into the Hindi that we use, which is sort of this very peculiarly governmental Hindi, mm. um, sort of films division Hindi. It's not Hindi that you speak on the streets, at least not in Bombay. Uh, voice of God Hindi. The voice of God Hindi, yes. Yeah. And, we had, and we were figuring out whether it should be, whether they should have this Sanskritized Hindi that we've used, or whether it should be an Urduized Hindi, whether it should be a male voice or a female voice, what should the tone of the voice be and all of that stuff happened and then we recorded that voiceover in Mukul's voice finally. And then Mukul then took that script and converted it into Hindi and then cut the film basically to that script. And it happened in two weeks, it was done. Um, and once it was done, uh, we went to our producers and, the, and we were of course panicking because there's a government agency, the producer, and you never know what they want removed. It could be anything. Uh, anything could offend them. Um, but it turned out that we went in for the meeting and they said, eh, why do you come? Your film is perfect. So we're like, yeah. We then went back and then we started actually layering the film with more ideas, uh, horizontally, I guess you could call it, uh, over that structure. Or is it vertically over vertically. that? Vertically over that structure. So then uh, new film clips emerged, new soundscapes emerged, we inserted new things within it. So that the, then the film became denser as it went along. But I think your question is also about the movement from one yeah. register to another, one medium to another yeah. and so on. And that is something that uh, it sets up from the very beginning, from the opening montage and through the various sequences. Uh, yeah, so thematically, formally those movements happen sometimes jerkily, sometimes bridged over by sound or voiceover. And uh, that was a challenge that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we set up. Ourselves and and you also insert all these still photographs that I'm sure you guys do. Yeah. They've been taking me. Polaroids all over Santa Barbara. <laughs>
Those, those still photographs are uh, uh, photographs taken by me of my family and there's one picture of me in there uh, when I had just started doing still photography because it's about us, it's us making a film about people like us, you know, who have been subjects of that modernity and we have grown up in those you know, in that state housing in Delhi. Uh, likewise, later, uh, there's a sequence which is shot in Rohan's house in, in Bombay. Uh, so we keep inserting ourselves into the film at regular intervals. You know, so, yeah. so, you know, a minute ago you said, Mukul, uh, home movies that were never made. Again, imploding that kind of easy timeline. And you talked about the querying of the timeline, right? So I have to respect that. So that's why I'm coming to this question now. Could have asked it before about your origins and how you came into this. So like, for instance, your practice as an architect and you know, teacher, how does it bring you to this? And same for you as a cinematographer, filmmaker. Because you said something really interesting. The vertical city that you made could hmm. be the sequel. sequel to this film, which yeah. was made about, what, five years ago? 2011, yeah. Hmm. So yeah, let me take that first. Um, of course, having grown up in uh, the 70s and 80s in Delhi, having grown up in a refugee housing colony built for refugees from Pakistan at the time of independence, I went back. The, 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 the place that you see over here is the place where I grew up. I don't spell it out, you know, in the film. But that entire place where there's this house with orange walls with these two elderly women sitting in, mm -hmm. in, uh, inside is the only house that has been minimally modified, you know. So we went back there and uh, filmed there and around that area, which is changing, has been changing very, very fast. Um, and as, you know, somebody who's been shooting documentary for a couple of decades, uh, there has been a sense of unease with the way you're looking at the subject, you know, uh, representing the subject uh, of uh, your film. Um, because the, uh, I'm, you know, it, I've, always question the gaze with which you're looking at a subject. It's a downward gaze. You are empathetic. You're empathetic, but you know, if you look at the state film, the state film has also meant well. You know, it's propagandist, but the state believes it means well. Likewise, the independent filmmaker means well. But the gaze, even if it's one of empathy, is a downward gaze saying, if the state was earlier saying, you need to become modern, Later, the activist is saying, oh, you haven't become modern. There's been a slippage. Let's do something about it, you know, with you or, you know, from, from the outside and so on. And that makes me uncomfortable, you know, where, of course, and likewise, you know, uh, in um, the Vertical City, there are these sequences where uh, there are these people who are looking straight at the camera. You know, uh, beginning, middle and end, there are sequences where there are people looking straight at the camera, again, with the sense of unease. So like it is here, uh, there is that sense of unease and the film towards the end deconstructs that entire moment where um, uh, your subject is looking at you, you are looking at the subject and we show ourselves loading the camera mm -hmm. and shooting it in this pristine, gorgeous black and white, having already shot it in color on video. And uh, yeah, the film could have ended with that. Let's say many documentaries might have ended with that moment of these children looking at the camera, hopefully slash helplessly, and it might have end. You know, the film might have ended there, but we couldn't do that. You know, we said no. That's that is the position that we want to critique. And uh, therefore, after that, what would be called this pristine black and white, you have this oversaturated, grainy, dark video of these women practicing drumming under a bridge in the city, you know, claiming space that's not meant for them, you know, occupying a space that's really not meant for them. So, yeah, I mean, you're reflecting on and critiquing your own practice and positions, which you've held all your life. Yeah. I've been particularly impatient with uh, architectural discourse over the past few years, because there seems to be uh, a sort of romanticization of what can be called Jugad. Mm -hmm. right? And what that very often does is that it, it, it actually comes, it, it, it acts as if the architect has no value system or rather should not have any because any value, not just the architect, anybody should not have any value system at all. Uh, and what we have instead is the sort of uh, romanticization of practices that are, that, that you find in, in, this, in the city without can, any critique. Can I? Yes, yeah, sorry. So Jugar, if you don't know, is the word that has become huge now 
for referring to all kinds of practices that you know people who don't have the means somehow make do. They cobble together, they make do, right? So jugar means putting together. Jugar also uh, comes from the same, it, etymologically it shares the same root as uh, technology. So it's know-how, but know-how that's often piratical, yeah. right? Copy, uh, salvaging, cobbling together. So that's the idea of jugar. But now it's touted even by the Harvard Business Review as a kind of bottom-up form of capitalism and enterprise. Yeah. So, and, and of course, I mean, in that sense, there are reasons why Jugaad exists, uh, because there are ways in which communities are managing to, let's say, uh, get resources uh, in, in situations which, where the state has just been, you know, unable to kind of provide those, uh, let's say, infrastructures. Uh, but what the state has started doing is that it has started saying that's fine, we can't do it anyway, therefore we won't. So then the state absorbs or takes, you know, doesn't take the responsibility for the provision of services or infrastructure, thinking that they're going to do it anyway. So then the question then begins is then what is the role of the architect? You know, whether we like it or not, architects have the burden of, like Mukul said earlier, of hoping or trying to make betterness in some way. Uh, and it has to come with some sort of value system. You can't simply, you know, throw his hands up and say, you don't care. So that has been one of the irritants for me. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a similar sort of question uh, concerning what is the role of architectural practice? Where, what are the value systems that it begins to uh, call its own? And how then does it begin to uh, intervene in some way? You know? uh, and those are not easy answers, but those are questions that we felt that, at least I felt at that point, that I needed to kind of start really dealing with. The collaboration now. How was that? What were the challenges? What were the most exciting moments of like, you know, trying to translate your own concerns in terms of the others? And you notice I'm smiling. <laughs> so, um, but um, it's not the first time we're working together. You know, um, we worked together on uh, the Project Cinema City uh, earlier. Um, Vertical City is all of, um, you know, um, Rohan's work with the design cell in his college. Uh, they're in the film um, talking about it. You don't see them on screen, but you hear their voices and they pretty much give the, um, yeah, I mean, they make the film. Um, yeah, so in this case, of course, uh, um, the script and, 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 and uh, much of the, of, of the concept for the film uh, comes from Rohan. And we go and shoot, and I, I, I think we pretty much respected each other's space, you know, <laughs> in, in that case. And uh, yeah, so I mean, if I were to joke about it, I'd say he could bully me about the architecture, and I could bully him about the film, and so on. Said, no, this is how it's going Which to be, did. and so on. So, <laughs> no, we yeah, had a sort of disagreements, of course. Uh, I still have pieces that I think, nah, ye na, you know, and he probably does too. Um, the uh, most, uh, the most, one of the biggest dis disagreements we had, and I'm going to use an example where I won, uh, <laughs> is is the Dilip Kumar sequence, okay. uh, the sequence from uh, Amar, that film where the, is this guy comes on a horse and falls off, and it's from a it's from a 1953 film, and Dilip Kumar, who is the lawyer. And you know, Ambedkar is a lawyer, uh, Gandhi was a lawyer, Nehru was a lawyer, and this lawyer comes riding a white horse, literally, into the village as the savior, falls off because this dupatta covers his face, meets this woman, this woman is you know, extraordinary. Uh, she's fascinated by him, he's fascinated by her, and uh, you know, she looks up to him as a sort of savior, and he looks down to her as that subject that he's going to improve. One night when it's raining and she's being chased by the local goon, she runs into the arms of the modern man, not just the arms, the home of the modern man uh, to be saved. And uh, what happens of course is what you see is that he doesn't know what to do once that thing that is supposed to be outside his home, which he can keep at a distance, enters. So he rapes her. This happens in the first one third of the film, and the rest of the film is this guilt of the modern man, which is just like suffering across the whole film. It's a very interesting film uh, because Dilip Kumar, the actor, has always played the 
iconic five-year plan hero. I mean, he was the man who they went to if they wanted a propaganda piece. So I felt it was really interesting, like really, you know, or like a really interesting story to insert in the middle of the film. And Mukul wasn't sure at all uh, because he felt like it underlined too much. It was too simplistic. It was flat. No, it, it wasn't that. Okay, it, it was, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my had was skeptical because you know at the rough cut stage uh, very often you don't know what's working and what's not mm -hmm. but skeptical about you know equating the body of the nation with the body of a woman that is violated mm -hmm. you know by yeah. this modern man you know who's the savior and so on and all the readings that might have and it, it took a while for that to settle in and we said okay fine you know the, this yeah needs to be here otherwise it's uh, maybe a little too easy it, it it adds it definitely adds that very very important uh, Note of critique. It becomes and a little edgy, edgy also. Yeah, I mean, and edgy to that. It becomes yeah. like, what in the world was that? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Amar, I was just telling uh, Mukul, is my favorite film, film, Bombay film from the 50s. And I was looking at a lot of these films in terms of my own work on the partition and its aftermath in cinema. And this is a film I write about because it's one of those incredibly interesting films that's done by this guy called Mehboob Khan, who in four years will go on to make Mother India you know, the mother of all melodramas and sort of the ur text of Bombay cinema. Uh, but in this film, it's sort of this rapacious modern nation state that does all kinds of, perpetrates all kinds of violences on a feminized uh, rural uh, yeah. interior, right? So uh, it's really interesting that it shows up. In fact, that was my next question at Why Amar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I really liked it actually, even though it's, yeah, one could say it's heavy-handed, but yeah. Yeah. given how much indirection you have in the rest of the film, it's fine, yeah. right? You, you <laughs> almost deny us meaning yeah. at times, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you want us to work hard. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I had to watch it six times, remember? <laughs> um, you all also have to, just say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I have really three quick questions. The migrant workers, the slum dwellers, the boys at the end who look back at you, and I love that uh, shot of the boys, three boys, because they're in front of the slums where they obviously live, but in the background you, you see these massive high-rise condominium structures that have come up. So they're the way kind of look, and you guys have already addressed it, but I wanted you to talk a bit more about it, because they're all men also. Yeah. Throughout, mm -hmm. yeah, who look back at you. Yeah. So that was also uh, the reason why we chose the male voiceover. Um, it was, we realized, I mean, it's not too difficult to realize, actually, is that it's a, it, the gender is a kind of, the women within the film are always placed within positions of like either they're cooking or they're cleaning or they're being mapped for the kitchen. I mean, this is the way that the modern Indian state uh, imagined mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the, the place of women and then we thought that you know could we then displace that by choosing a female voiceover uh, but we very clearly decided not to and decided to own the voice of the state so that we can critique it from within if that worked at all um, so this and, and and that's the way that the film gets set up actually it gets set up in this sort of uh, very uh, sort of male way if you want to call it that which is why the end becomes really important because it is a way in which that 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 gaze begins to disintegrate uh, towards the end, where the voiceover that seemed so certain in the beginning uh, now is asking kind of these strange questions in terms of like trying to grasp at trying to understand something and creating homes that are just like makeshift imaginations so that you can pretend that you know mm -hmm. something in the face of let's say the void. Yeah, if I were to interject, it goes from being a propagandist to a soliloquy towards the end. Mm. So. Soliloquy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is also the uh, anxiety of the ethnographic filmmaker, mm. right? Yeah. And those are the segments that are most ethnographic film type. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The looking back. And yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to go back to the point of the language where, of course, this is uh, the Hindi that uh, the state uses. You hear it on All India Radio, on uh, Doordarshan National Television, on uh, you know um, any state communication. But it's also the Hindi that comes to you uh, in the art cinema of the seventy of the sixties and seventies. You know, it's uh, apart from referring, you know, from making a reference to proper the language of propaganda. 
we are also we also want to take joy in that in the beauty of that language and the fact that uh, when you're talking about the state documentary films division at the peak of its um, period of production was dubbing its films into 16 languages so the voiceover was just a module which could be taken out and it could be in bengali it could be in tamil it could be in punjabi it could be in anything and you'd have the same film but you know with with a different voiceover altogether so you are uh, again you know referring to that form why did you choose to end with that band playing under the overpass or whatever that is, the flyover or the bridge? And, you know, how much of that has to do with the present context in which this film has been made? Yeah. So, um, like Mughal said earlier, uh, there are certain kinds of questions uh, that we have, at least I have, concerning our own kind of position as left-leaning, liberal sorts of individuals. Um, and understanding that in many ways we have failed. We have failed in many ways, which is the moment we are at right now. We've given up any sorts of political strength and the right has been able to kind of come in and take over that moment. Right? They have been able to kind of connect to the grassroots, which at least in Bombay, the left has been completely unable to do. Uh, it's a really complicated time uh, for us in India. Uh, and I think that moment that, that, that uh, that's the Shiv Sena who was playing, the, the Shiv Sena is a writing organization in Bombay, uh, which manages to claim public space for women. It manages to get slum dwellers, uh, light, electricity and sewage. Uh, it is right wing. Drinking water. It, it manages to get them drinking water. It is right wing. Uh, it manages to create libraries uh, in the slums. It does all of these things too. Right? Meanwhile, uh, and it has been in power in Bombay for 20 years or more. Uh, and we are sitting there, you know, kind of smug in our own self-satisfaction of having that great idea of, you know, freedom, etc. But we are not being able to reach the people who we are so-called care about, who are still kind of within that gaze, looking up at the camera, wondering, who are you and what are you trying to do to me? You know? So that end sequence actually is the anxiety that we have to look at, the anxiety of modernity. Um, and trying to figure out what is this model that is that we don't seem to have that we haven't figured out uh, that we so easily dismiss of as well. Okay, uh, what is it? You know, there's some things that are so distasteful, and yet they manage to do something that we have not managed to do. And that is really what the question is, because the way that that leads up, you have that end, which is this home in the middle of nothingness in Gurgaon that landscape of absolute dystopia, high-rise buildings with just desolation in between. Um, then you have Mukul be shooting that desolation in that sort of gorgeous, you know, evening light, yellow, pink, very aestheticized. And then we push that aestheticization even a little bit further by shooting that aestheticization on film and showing Mukul make that image was a self critique of course, but and then watching them and watching that thinking, okay, now is this, is this hopelessness? But we watch that there's, there are other modes through which modernity mm. is being claimed. Yeah. And modern, and it's, more, it's, it's a modernity. It's a modernity of those women, you know, banging the drums and abandoned below a flyover is a modernity too. But we don't seem to have the tools to be able to grasp or understand that. Or even begin to engage with that. Uh, before today, these two filmmakers were telling me how someone complimented them somewhere before this, saying that they were very erudite and articulate filmmakers and what a pleasure it is to meet them, so I won't say that. Thank you. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.